Good morning. And uh, my name is Richard Burns. I'm a member of the festival committee. And on behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome you all to the sixth annual Nantucket Book Festival. Thank you very much for being here. It's, you're the lifeblood of the festival. Without you, our, our work would be for naught. Um, we'd also like, I'd also like to thank our, our major sponsors, um, Nantucket Island Resorts, Nantucket Historical Association, the Dreamland, the Nantucket Athenaeum, WCAI, N Magazine, the Inquirer and Mirror, Wendy Schmidt, and the Haft Foundation. They've been generous in their support and allow us to offer a, 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 the events that are, for the most part, free. And uh, we intend, you, intend to continue that, that practice f for as long as you keep coming and we have uh, the, uh, the heart to continue, which I think will be for a long time. Um, we, we do rely a lot on your support and I, I hope that you'll, you'll check in with one of our volunteers before you leave and um, perhaps make a, a donation to the cause and also fill out the comment sheet so that we can keep you apprised of our doings during the year. Samantha Hunt's first novel, The Seas, whose narrator is convinced that she is a mermaid, won the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35 Award. Her second novel, The Invention of Everything Else, which chronicles, among other things, the, fu the last days of Nikola Tesla, the great inventor, won the Bard Fiction Prize and was a finalist for the Orange Prize. So among all of the, the possible works that could follow such beginnings, we are given Mr. Splitfoot, a novel in which some of the characters commune with the dead. It's also a novel of the motherless and mothers of the orphaned and the rescued, of the spiritual and the profane, and a, a work of prose that sh offers a, a shimmering backlight to the characters' journeys across New York State, which in this novel is a, a land of mysterious motives and ordinary wonders that accompany the characters as they crisscross the boundaries of, of countless worlds which each and every one of us inhabits. Uh, Samantha Hunt has recently received a Guggenheim Fellowship which will allow her to take a year off from her teaching at Pratt and to think about and to write about some of the other curious and wonderful things that are going on. Would you please join me in welcoming Samantha Hunt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dick. That was so nice. And I am so happy to be back at the Athenaeum. This is such a special place. I don't have to tell you, right? But um, I have a connection to this island, a deep one. Two of my sisters are year-round residents for 25 years, which is impossible since we're all 24 years old, but <laughs> we were here as spirit babies, yeah. Um, but thank you for coming. This morning, uh, I'm going to talk mostly about Mr. Splitfoot, and if time permits, a little bit about a new book coming out this summer, The Dark Dark. Uh, I thought that since it's the start of the festival, I would tell you about the book in a way where I tell you how I started it. 
because there wasn't a simple answer. People always ask you that, like, well, how'd you get the idea? And I'm always like, um, well, uh, because I feel like there's about six ideas, which has to do with the way that I write, where I kind of walk through the world, and I'm like, I like that. I'm going to take that. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to keep that. I'm going to keep that. And then I have, you know, six or seven things that have nothing to do with each other, and I try to make them have something to do with each other. Um, and so I think the, the first thing that I was thinking about as I was, oh, oh, let me tell you quickly what the book is about too. So the book is actually two books and it was my original fantasy to have them bound back to back uh, when I was like dreaming about it and so that a reader would read one chapter, flip it over, read the other chapter, flip it over, read the other chapter, flip it over. But I have, you know, a, a, I work with a pretty traditional big press and they were like, whoa, you're blowing our minds, we can't do that. You know? And I was like, but people do that all the time. So I wasn't allowed to do that, but um, that turned out to be okay. I liked that idea though, and I had that idea in mind because as Dick was saying in the introduction, a lot of it is about this split and the way that you can use a split to have an argument, right? I knew that I wanted to write about religion and I knew that I wanted to write about uh, belief and disbelief um, because that's very much how I experience the world. I'm like, yes, I believe. No, I don't believe. The same exact thing at the same time, right? So I wanted to keep that argument present. It's also the split of two characters. Um, the main characters are Ruth and Nat, and they've grown up in a group home situation, and they're about to age out of foster care. They're 17, and they're terrified to age out of foster care, despite the fact that their foster home is not a great place at all. It's run by a man named Father, Father Arthur who is a wild fundamentalist with a lot of really, really bizarre ideas about how things should be done. Like all the children have to dress in 18th century clothing. You know, they're not allowed to participate in um, contemporary society at all really. The other book inside the book is about a very, very long walk across New York State. Ruth, it's 14 years after the first narrative, and Ruth has come back to get her, her niece, who's pregnant. She's around 24 years old and she's pregnant. Ruth doesn't talk in that section. She won't say anything. And that was one of the challenges I set myself. I was like, what if you had a silent character? And how would you write language for a silent character? At the time I was, um, and still, I was really kind of obsessed with these with silent women and what that means and why there are so many. Um, the singer Linda Thompson was somebody I was thinking about a lot, right? And here she is a singer and she lost her voice for 11 years and I thought, oh my gosh, what can that possibly mean? I was thinking about Maya Angelou who was also silent for years of her life, three years of her life. Um, and Marianne Faithful spent some time in silence, right? Uh, and somebody from my own family, my great-grandmother, she lost her voice for her entire life. She'd had a baby, she'd moved, okay, so she moved away from her sisters. She was one of eight sisters, and she moved away from them to get married and into a kind of hostile environment where the other women were like, hmm, we don't like you marrying our guy. And Billy Dwell, you know, he was like the town's sweetheart and he was really handsome. I have photos of him. And so the local women were mad at her and she had her first child and the child wouldn't nurse. And the women said, don't you dare feed him cow's milk because he'll turn into a beast. And she listened to the women and she, the baby died and she stopped talking. My dad remembers her, I never met her, but, um, my dad remembers, like, she, she lived with him at, at, at the end of her life and she would never speak. And she had four more children, but she just didn't talk. And so that story has always haunted me. Um, so I gave myself this challenge to make a voiceless woman. But I totally cheated because there's another book where she talks all the time, right, <laughs> when she's younger. Um, okay, so I think that's really, oh, Ruth also has a bad scar on her face. Um, there's another character named Mr. Bell who young Ruth and Nat encounter and he openly tells them that he's a con man. And um, there's a character named Lord who Cora is in love with, kind of. He's a bad guy. 
he is the father of this child in her stomach. I think that's all I want to tell you. So to start, okay, my first obsession and, and how I got on this was that I wanted to tell a ghost story. I love ghost stories. Maybe that has something to do with the Nantucket um, obsession too, right? You, you're a good ghost town, a great ghost town. Um, and when I was six years old, I got a record off a back box a cereal box, which I wish they still did this, right? It's funny, I, so I'm staying at the JC, and they had a record player in the dining room this morning playing Smokey Robinson, and I was like, that's amazing, because my book is a lot about records, vinyl records. My husband and I have a big vinyl record collection, and, and I think about records a lot, and even that structure for a story, they're around and round and round and round. but I was like, yeah, Smokey Robinson. It was so funny, because a lot of people in the JC dining room this morning were like, turn that off, and I was like, oh. Smoke it. Yeah. <laughs> Gonna get me through. So anyways, this record that was on the back of a cereal box, oh, it was so good and it was so scary. And it was told this story, the ghost story that you all know about the little girl, who, the hitchhiker, right? And the nice guy picks her up and she's like, can you take me home? Ooh, and then they get home, right? Mm. Do you know this one? Yeah, no? Okay, well, she runs out of the car and uh, he goes to get her and she has his windbreaker on, right? And the mother is in the house and she's like, no, she's dead, she's dead. And he goes out and it's raining and he can't see. And sure enough, there's the grave with his windbreaker in it. I mean, it's, it's a really cheesy ghost story, but I loved it at six years old. And I listened to it probably, no exaggeration, like 500 times. And uh, so that, oh, that was so deeply embedded. And I used that in Mr. Splitfoot all these years later. And, and in many, many different forms, I tell that story again and again. Uh, I want to read, I'm going to do tiny readings, mi micro readings, to just illustrate these things. Um, but I want to read you a little bit about the ghost story. It's, this is a conversation between Lord, the bad guy, and Cora. They're on a camping trip. What kind of books do you read, he asks. It takes me a second to say it, not because I don't know who I am, but because Lord throws off a lot of interference. I like ghost stories. Ghost stories suck. They aren't real. Oh, yeah? Yeah. He drinks his beer. All stories are ghost stories, I tell him. Is that right? Yep. He's making fun of me, but I don't care. You want to hear one? A ghost story? Yeah. Fine. Okay, ready? Sure. Sure, here we go. But then I don't start yet. I want it quiet, real scary and silent before I say anything. Let Lord listen to the woods. Okay. Okay. You know West Lane, that twisty road that heads out to the highway? Sure. Well, it was dark out there one night. It's always dark out there, right? Raining, you know, a dark road, wet road, no one around. I put plenty of space around each word, each small description. Slowly, slowly. A man, a fellow about your age, was driving home on that road squinting through the raindrops on his windshield when all of a sudden, there's a pretty girl standing in the street, eight years old, wearing a summer dress, wrong for the weather. I think she was in my cousin's class at school, but I don't remember her name. Maybe you knew her. Anyway, guy slams on the brakes, right? Right. I look into the woods. I look at my hands in the firelight. He tells her to get in. It's freezing, wet, cold. Climb in, he says. I'll take you home. Right? Lord nods. Right. Like I'm wasting his time. Thank you, she says. And I know, I tell Lord, if you're like me, you think that's the scary part, right? Young girl, bad dude. That's not the scary part. Just hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so the other, uh, another part of, of starting this book was that I was 
about 25 months pregnant because I was having twins, so I can say that, right? Not, I guess I'd have to say like 16 months pregnant. Okay, anyways, so um, I was so pregnant actually that I did a reading at Brown University at the time and it was exactly like this and I couldn't do it because I was like, <laughs> like, hello, nice to talk to you. I couldn't do it, I just did like that. The whole reading, I was like, <laughs> couldn't get close enough. Anyways, I was so large that I was really pretty immobilized by that pregnancy and I just moved to upstate New York. And of course, all I wanted to do was explore and see everything and I couldn't. Um, and it was kind of driving me crazy. So the fantasy of taking a really, really long walk across the state was all I wanted to think about. I was like, yes, yes, keep walking, keep walking. Um, and, and just questions of mobility. And, and the slowness, too. Also, also in, I think that hand in hand with that was, was an obsession of technology and slowing down and how technology doesn't allow us to have uh, attention anymore, right? And that that uh, process of walking seemed like one of paying attention um, and seeing things. Um, there's a line in the book where, where Cora says, her cell phone breaks as they're walking quickly. I had to get away, I had to like get rid of the cell phones. And uh, it breaks really quickly and she says, I'm smarter now that my smartphone's gone because she's able to start paying attention, right, in this wonderful way. And uh, as Dick was saying, a lot of the book is about um, mothering in some way, in some kind of twisted way. And so we have this pregnancy throughout the book. Um, but one of my greatest joys was creating this landscape of upstate New York and trying to pay attention like that and just driving around and being like, oh, okay, no, 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 no. So I just want to read you the briefest description of that kind of collection of, of detail and environment that I was um, loving to collect. You pick signs, dot the landscape. Modular homes are for sale. Billboards advertise cluster fly spraying services and the power of cheese. Outside an Oneida casino, a handmade sign says, no sovereign nation, no reservation. And then karaoke with Roger and Arlene. Silos, flags, tractor sales, and cabins. Aging Christmas decorations, yard sales, summer camps rifle ranges, meth heads in trucks, and gray people behind screen doors who look out as we pass. A large bird, Lord would know what kind, perches on one foot in an irrigation ditch. Cloud shadows on fields and a father smoking a cigarette, hauling his kids down the road's shoulder in a trailer hitched to his lawnmower. Thunder and lightning, up and down, up and down, Sometimes I think about sex while we walk. We never travel far in one day. We might spend two hours walking. We might go as long as four. Where are we going, I ask Ruth. Then, are we even here? She doesn't get, ever get an answer from Ruth, and you can imagine it starts to make her crazy. She doesn't know where they're going the entire walk. But because she's a bit desperate to get out of her situation, she follows her aunt anyway. Part of that wanderlust for upstate was um, just a historical and wanting to know this new area that I had moved into. And one of the first things that I discovered was how many religions started there. Mormonism, spiritualism didn't start there, but it has a really strong foothold in the Lilydale community. Um, a, a kind of Victorian summer camp where people just talk to the dead all day. Has anybody visited Lilydale? It's amazing. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll describe it to you then because it's pretty amazing. So it's kind of, it's like Chautauqua, um, but instead of having musical performances and intellectual uh, lectures, they talk to the dead. So I went, I went with my family <laughs> and stayed in a hotel and there was a sign posted in the hotel that said, you know, no seances in the hotel, we don't want to release the ghosts here, you know, that's for outside the hotel. And I was like, wow, okay, I'm glad we're safe here. Um, so my favorite thing that I found at Lilydale was there, it's a place called Inspiration Stump and it's just past the pet cemetery in the woods and you go there about three times a day in the summer and they have visiting mediums come and, and it's you know a group like this gathered outside 
and the medium will start talking and she'll say, you in the pink, there's a man here and he wants you to know that you, know, you need to go back to school and become a teacher now. And the, and the person would be like, okay, all right. Uh, you, you know, is there somebody named Harry here? And it was kind of almost done like an auction for the dead, you know? It was like, I'll take Harry, you know, I'll claim Harry. And I just, I thought it was amazing. And, and I'll, I'll say that I initially went with a, a lot of cynicism um, and not believing that. And, and when I realized who the people in the audience were, it turned out that most of them were mothers of dead children. And I, at the time, had a, just a one child, a one-year-old, and everything changed for me when I realized that. And I thought, yep, I'd be here too if I lost my child, of course. You know? And I, I actually started to see it as something very hopeful that these parents were then thinking, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remain part of life. Um, and so I, I, I saw it as super hopeful. And as I got more involved with talking to people who talk to the dead, um, I, I started to abuse it a little bit. Like I got a blurb from Charlotte Bronte. I don't know if you saw that on the book, but I went to a medium and I was like, can you get a, this woman to talk about this book? And she was like, no problem, that's $60. <laughs> and I thought, all right, this is so much easier than getting blurbs from friends. Um, <laughs> So I, I, did, I did start to abuse it a little, but it was in that, those exchanges that I also realized that the, the women, and I did go to all women, although there are, of course, some male mediums, um, I did realize that um, they're exactly like me. You know, Their con artistry is making up a story on the spot. And I was like, man, it takes me six years to make up a story. I was like, these women are amazing. They're doing it like at the drop of a hat. And I thought, could I do that? If somebody was like, make, you know, tell me a story right here, right now. And, and I also really gained a humongous respect for them because I thought, well, my life has been changed by reading fiction. So what's, why shouldn't someone's life be changed by listening to these women? As long as they're not saying, deposit all your money in this account, right? You know? um, and so I, I started to really admire these women and, and, th and also consider myself a bit of a con artist and with all the respect that term deserves in some way. Uh, the section I want to read you about that is at one of the seances. So Nat and Ruth start talking to the dead, and there's some debate whether they're really talking to the dead or not, right? Uh, through the, under the auspices of Mr. Bell, their con man leader who brings them into this. Uh, this is, this section's a, a little bit longer, and it's the longest one I'll do today. Let me find it. Okay. <clears throat> Nat changes into an outfit selected by Mr. Bell, a pale blue button-up shirt with just a glimpse of a black lanyard cord showing around his neck. His pants are woven to a silver sheen. He wears his own work boots. Mr. Bell hadn't thought to purchase shoes. Nat's hair is brushed. For Ruth, Mr. Bell selected a celery cover-up. The tag inside says, made in India, and another one, Goodwill store, $4. Her bra shows through the fabric. The gown drags on the floor. It smells like wet wool. She sits next to Nat on the couch. They look like 17-year-olds impersonating Floridian retirees. Neither of them leans back. Even Mr. Bell is nervous. Even he seems young. I'll wait in the foyer. Finally, there's a knock. Please, let me take your coats and then, oh, what a lovely kerchief, welcome. Mr. Bell leads the older married couple into the living room. Perhaps they're here to contact someone before they themselves pass on. They sit opposite Nat and Ruth. The man rubs his palm, palms on his thighs. It's embarrassing to admit one believes the dead can speak. His wife twists his wrist like an accelerator on a motorcycle, and the whole premise suddenly strikes Ruth as bizarre. Why do the living assume the dead know better than we do? Like they gain some knowledge by dying. But why wouldn't they just be the same confused people they were before they died? Nat and Ruth quickly realized they should have waited in the kitchen until the audience was assembled. Next time. Another knock, two more couples, same as the first, white and nervous. No one speaks. 
The people steal glances at Nat and Ruth, glowing, toxic child brides. One of the couples seems to have arrived straight from a punk concert. Her skin is gray from cigarettes. His hairdo is as big as hers. In opposition, the next couple looks like health nuts, comfortable shoes, thin as marathoners, people who vote. Everyone has dead people. Mr. Bell comes in last. His movements belong to a man who doesn't need sleep. He takes a long time pulling the nylon curtain across a bay window. Then he raises one brow, meaning, I've done my part to separate these people from their money. Now it's up to you, partner. Nat looks like a fine blue thing. Ruth gets to work before thought can catch up. She raises her hands, holding the sun. Great unseen force, remove all obstructions between this world and theirs. Lift the veil so that we might receive guidance and the gift of spirit here with us tonight. She holds her pose for just a moment. Such antics come naturally after life with the father. Mr. Bell nods, and she's practiced. Close your eyes. Their movements are swift. Each of the six obey her readily. She takes Nat's hands, ready? His chin is already lolling, saliva gathering between his teeth. But what's the point of Nat's rabies routine if everyone's eyes are closed? A misstep. Open your eyes, please. She focuses her gaze, pinning down the air between them, urging it to become charged. Hello? She asks gently, politely. She doesn't name it Mr. Splitfoot in front of strangers who might imagine the devil. That's not what Ruth thinks. For her, Mr. Splitfoot is a two that is sometimes a one. Mothers and their children, Nat and Ruth, life and death. Are you there? Then, there, then gone. Again, she whispers, hello. Crap is the first word from Nat as not Nat, the rough voice, eyes rolled back. Sorry, crawl? Crack. The marathoners sit upright. Crack, Ruth asks to confirm. Crack, crack, who's there? Is there a name? Nat shakes his head as if water is lodged in one ear. Car. The marathoner's wife is perched on the edge of her chair, ready to pounce on a bingo. Car, Ruth verifies the message. Car? The wife poses. Crack! Nat repeats a bullwhip. His hips begin to stir, winding up. That's her. The wife reaches out to touch what's ever there. Our daughter. She explains to the others. Carolina. Drugs, her father said. But we hadn't imagined crack. We don't know anything. He stares at the carpeting. He looks intelligent, and Ruth wonders if he'll suspect a con but he lifts his gaze to the top of his wife's head, so depleted by grief, he's divorced from reality. Carolina, he calls out, sweetheart. Carolina, Ruth tries to confirm. Car, Nat says, low, slow. Mommy and daddy are here. The mother's eyes roam, tracing the air near the ceiling. Creak, Nat says, we have a contact. Ruth is some sort of ghost traffic controller, confirms. She adjusts her body on the brown plaid couch. Would you like to deliver a message, Carolina? <laughs> Nat dribbles like a baby, lurching low over the pressed wood coffee table. Ruth feels suddenly sick. Their dead child's been reduced to grunts from a boy in slick polyester clothing. A smile crosses Nat's face. He speaks clearly, precisely, dramatically. I'll tell you a story, a lovely story. You must hear it. I shall tell it to you. There, now you sit there. All six paying clients lean in. The marathoners are particularly eager. Every ache they felt since their girl's been gone. Nat's eyes flutter, revealing a bit of white each time. His mouth resembles a sea creature's. On the dark nights, stormy nights, you can hear him, the wind and the fluttering of his great cloak, beating wings. Nat raises his voice, his best Vincent Price. At the midnight hour, he gallops, always searching, always seeking. And if you stand on the bridge at the wrong hour, his great cloak sweeps around you. His cold arms clasp you to his bony chest, and forever you must ride and ride and ride. Nat's head tumbles to his chest, wasted after his performance. Oh, the mother says. 
the very story of addiction. Carolina's father shakes his head, tears are forming. He holds his daughter's name in his mouth. Is there something you'd like to say to Carolina, Ruth asks. The mother turns to her husband, the destruction of the past years evident on her skin. Mommy and daddy are here, the mother whispers. Mommy and daddy, she begins. Every failure she served her daughter ruffles her face. How she forgot to pack 100 Cheerios on the 100th day of kindergarten. How she was late to high school graduation because the parking lot was congested. Nights that teeth went unflossed. Nap moves. He braces his arms on his knee. He shakes a little bit. From the shoulders, some sort of boogie-woogie. Donald, he calls out, loud and sunny. The marathoners twist their noses. They don't know anyone named Donald. Donald and Carolina, Nat finally says the dead girl's name. Together forever, and that's a long time. Nat giggles, does the Elvis shake again, and then it's over. He grabs the back of his neck, looks at those gathered, and disappears into the back of the house. The father, having waited for a sign to break down, does a whining moan. Tears shake his chest. He balls his hands in front of his eyes, but the mother's sorrow is most sickening. Carolina, she stands, Carolina. She swings her hands through the air, searching for her daughter's body. Carolina, don't go. But there's nothing there. Mr. Bell offers the mother a box of tissues. She holds onto the box with two hands as if it is someone's head. She sobs. No one knows how to comfort her, so they don't. They listen to her cry until eventually the punk guy interrupts. Sorry, but that's it? Where's our dead person? Where's theirs? He points to the older couple. Ruth collects her gown around her. Communication with the spirit world can be utterly exhausting for the medium, Mr. Bell says. I'll remind you, there's no guarantee with the dead. It's not AT&T. Excuse me? The freaking kid tells one crazy-ass story for a hundred bucks? You gotta be freaking kidding me. He throws his shoulders back, getting in Mr. Bell's face. My wife lost her dad last year, so you get that little faggot back out here. A hundred? We paid more than that, the old guy says. <laughs> Mr. Bell sours, things are about to go very badly indeed. Sir, please. This is bull, barrel chest turns to the others. Carolina's mom huffs. Just because your dead person didn't show up doesn't mean my dead person? He's shouting like a drunken uncle. Ruth pulls her legs onto the couch under the cover of her gown. You think your dead kid's better than my father-in-law? Black curls in a red face. He beats one hand into the other. I bet you do. Think because you paid more that your dead kid's going to show up while we get nothing? Screw you and screw your dead kid. Please, please, Mr. Bell moves between the two like a jumping spider. What did you say, Carolina's mother asks. What did you say? But it's Carolina's father who responds. He's still crying, but he uses all that grief to land a punch on barrel chest's left ear. The guy ducks, but not enough, and the punch throws him back into his chair. Please, Mr. Bell shouts, please. What the hell, barrel chest goes crazy. He punched me, he tells his wife. The freaking stiff punched me. He flexes his arms, an overweight gorilla about to charge when Ruth has a moment of inspiration. She rolls her eyes back and mustering a clear, crowd-dousing voice asks, sweetheart? Loud enough to draw the heated room to immediate attention. Peanut, she continues. Everyone's watching her now. Sugar, little girl, baby doll princess? The punk wife grips her husband's flexed arms. Oh my God, Mike, it's him. <laughs> I'll stop that one there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I, I maybe am I? Do we have to stop for time? There's there's one short more reading. Do we have time, Dick, or no? What's that? Stop. Wind it up. Okay. Okay, and take some questions. Okay. Um, the, I'll just tell you the one shortest thing. So part of the the project was to make my own religion. I was like, hey, I'm just gonna make my own religion and see how that works because I was talking about so many different religions. 
And the way that I did it was I took everything that I loved and I was like, okay, kitchen sink it, you know, throw it in. So I was like, I put some records in there. I put Carl Sagan in there. I love Carl Sagan. I was like, throw Cosmos in there. And um, it still ends very badly. He, you know, it turns into a cult and it's, and it's horrible. But the most fun part of that was that I made my own religious text. And I did it by totally plagiarizing um, the Book of Mormon, the Bible, the Constitution, all these old rock and roll songs, and I, and I threw them in there. And so I, I, it was kind of fun to see how that would um, turn out. But I'll read you just the smallest bit from the, it's just in the introduction, it's like five lines. And this is all plagiarized from other sources, but it made some sort of sense. I was like, ah, perfect. We are approaching the greatest of mysteries, We float like a moat of dust in the morning sky. We know that this is impossible. We the people, we believed all the words which thou hast spoken. We cannot understand the words. We fled all that day into the wilderness, even until it was dark. We commanded the rocks and the mountains to fall upon us, to hide us. We will, we will rock you. Thank you guys so much. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> do, do folks have questions? I'm happy to answer questions. Um, yeah, where is, is it Lilydale? Lily, Lily, yeah. Where, where? So it's just south of Buffalo. Um, it's pretty far out there. Yeah, it's all the way across the state. But um, but it's it's worth visiting sometime. You can go to Niagara then too, and but it's pretty near there. It's worth visiting. I've never seen anything quite like that. Yeah, uh, and it's also it's not too far from the uh, another site I visited was the Mormons uh, where Joseph Smith started. Yeah, Mount Cumora, and they have a pageant every summer where they staged the Book of Mormon, and it was amazing. I mean, it was like the best Broadway show ever. I couldn't believe it. It was Jesus comes flying on a string across the mountain. I was like, whoa, what's going on? It was pretty intense, pretty amazing to see, and fun that, you know, in this tiny town in upstate New York, such pageantry is happening. And of course, right outside, the Baptists were yelling at the Mormons, and I thought, oh, this is perfect for my book. (laughs) They're like, we have the true message. No, we have the true. I was like, okay, all right. (laughs) Yeah. I'd say it was a lot of micro revelations, yeah. Um, and I'm honestly, the way that I proceed is I just start writing um, and, and write in scenes, and and then I start to see. I mean, I guess overall, I had the the idea of the ghost story over all of that, but th- it's not true because sometimes I would be like, oh, this is a book about mothering or bad mothering. This is a book about ghosts. This is a book about religion. This is a, and, um, and so one would come to the fore. I, this book did take me six years to write, so that maybe is, is part of how I did it. My children were really small when I was writing this book. In fact, they were born, my, I have twins also and a singleton, and the twins were born right as I was starting it. And so, you know, it, this book was written in five minute sections, I'll tell you. Those of you who are feeling like you don't have enough time to write, if you have five minutes, you can, <laughs> over six years, you can write a book, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's a great question, and I wish I had a better answer for you. It, 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 I guess a lot of the answer has to do with being comfortable for a long period with a total disaster. And then at the end saying, okay, wait, maybe this does have relevance, or maybe, you know, maybe these do work together. But at the beginning, writing that way of all these things that don't necessarily seem to have anything to do with each other is hard. Yeah, and many got discarded too, right? Oh yeah, so the new book is short stories. Um, and so that was easier to throw in all of the junk, all of the junk. I, I very consciously in the new book um, allowed myself to work with that process because I do love writing that way. Um, there was. One of the stories was just published a couple weeks ago, and it's really 
constructed in just these tiny paragraphs that seem to have no connection until the bitter end. It's a woman um, terrified in the middle of the night just thinking her thoughts and you know her thoughts range as as anyone's thoughts do in the middle of the night from like at one point she's thinking about coyotes eating her children you know and another point she's like thinking about an author who she loves and so it goes it pops all over the place um, and I guess the challenge in that kind of writing is finding okay then what does link this all together right I hope I hope I achieved that <laughs> yeah Oh, yes. I, 85% of my work is revision, is done in revision, honestly. And for Mr. Splitfoot, uh, the joy in revising was that <clears throat> it is a spooky book, slightly. It's not like, you're not going to, it's not Stephen King spooky, but it is a little bit spooky. And part of the joy was taking the two books and seeing places where you could poke a hole and see through to the other book. And so I would have these moments of overlap that are probably the creepiest moments of the book where you see the other book through it and you're like, oh, ooh, what's going on here? And, and that, I, in the revision, was the most fun part where I could see, oh wait, these moments line up and I'm gonna like open a tiny curtain like peeking through a ton donné, right? You're looking in the crack in the wall and... So that was something that you discovered sort of spontaneously? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, in the revision, just kind of trying to smooth that, mm -hmm. yep. Anybody else have a question? Have a great book festival, and thank you so much for coming out so early to see me. I appreciate it. Thank you.